It's been a good morning. I just feel the sweet, sweet presence of the Lord here this morning. And I love how Colby had us um, hang on to hands and raise them up as we sang, I exalt thee. And it just made me think as we were exalting the Lord and holding hands, and he was talking about, Lord, you know, help us see you at the center of our hearts. Help us put you at the center of our lives. But when we're hanging on to hands, we're reminded that we need to encourage one another that we need to be there for one another, that we need to hold each other up because we don't do this journey alone. And so that was twofold. And I just thought that was just a beautiful reminder of the Father's heart uh, for us and how he works uh, in our hearts and in our midst. And so good. And so this morning, I've had lots of um, confirmations <laughs> of where we're going um, and what I'll be teaching on this morning. And so... Um, Amongst all the things that happened to Colby and myself and Andrew and Shirley in Uganda, there was, there was something kind of on the outer edges of what we experienced. Um, it kind of caught my attention, but it wasn't central to some of the things that we were doing. So I kind of, you know, I just kind of put it in my back pocket for a later date. I thought, you know, God, you'll bring up when I'm supposed to look at that. And so the Lord brought it to my attention this week. Um, and I do some of my best thinking in the shower. So I'm sitting in the shower, just reflecting on, you know, uh, you know, God, what do you, you know, what are we going to speak about this week? What do you want, you know, what do you want to share with your people? So the water is pouring over me, and I love a hot shower. <laughs> and so, and I was thinking about this week's message and the whole concept of the Lord as a fountain flowing, His life flowing over us and flowing around us. He is the source. He is the fountain. He's the source of our very life. Um, we breathe the air around us. That literally is his breath. And so he is the source. And so in Uganda, the Nile River is a very important body of water. And so this is a fresh source of water, and it's very important to all the countries that it flows through, right? It's the water that they're going to utilize for so many things. And so it flows through Egypt, Sudan, Uganda, Tanzania, Kenya, Rwanda, Ethiopia. It's a life source for both people and animals. So you can see it behind me there. Um, so Colby and I flew into Kampala which is the capital of Uganda, which is situated next to Lake Victoria, which is the largest body of water in Africa. And you can see it at the bottom of the map there. I'm kind of standing in front of it. Um, so it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful lake uh, full of uh, fish. Um, and as we left Kampala, because we had to head upwards towards Gulu, uh, we were told that once you cross the Nile River, you're going to notice that the terrain looks a lot drier because we're getting away from the water source, right? And we were also told that as we were crossing the Nile, that we were not to take any pictures. Like, what? <laughs> I want a picture of the Nile. Um, and we were also told to be, you know, be aware, um, take note of the military, the military presence that was on the bridge. I was like, oh, okay. Now, the majority of the reason for the presence of the military was to protect the East and the West, um, or keep the, keep the uh, East from being separated from the West, because there have been militants that would want to take control of the West, and they can take control if they can get control of the bridge. And war has been a long problem in Uganda, but there is also something about this amazing source of water. Access to this river is very important, right? It's its fresh source. And so, Arguably, uh, the Nile River is the longest river in the world, though there is now some debate that the mighty Amazon River might just be a little bit longer. <laughs> and so, now, what I heard that struck me was that for the longest time, the source of this mighty river was unknown. They didn't know how it started. It stumped many explorers in the wilds of Africa, Sudan, and Egypt. Where does this river originate? They really wanted to know. And humankind, as we know, we have this innate desire to solve mysteries. I mean, we sent people to the moon <laughs> and we're continuing to do things like that. So they wanted to know what is the story behind 
um, you know, where does this river start? We need to know. And so um, I want to dig a little bit into the story behind the discovery of the source of the mighty Nile River. And I want to encourage you, as I'm sharing this story, to try and connect the dots. See, what happens in the physical, the physical realm that we live in, is a reflection of what happens in the spiritual world. There's a lot of value in paying attention to the physical world around us. So I want to encourage you to use your imaginations, use your minds, use your inner and your spirit uh, to see, God, how are you working? How do you work through, how would you work through the Nile? So uh, one of the articles I read, Gwen Tompkins says, all great mysteries begin at the end and end at the very beginning. I thought that was quite profound. And for thousands of years, the Nile River was perhaps the world's greatest mystery. So the map that's next, anyone, who can, anyone can see where the Nile ends. It's very clear. It pours through Egypt into the Mediterranean Sea. But locating the origins of this magnificent river befuddled nearly everybody. So a video is going to play behind me that I took when we were on the Nile River. Colby and I got a chance to experience the Nile. And I'm just going to share a little bit of the story with you as the video plays. There's no sound to the video, so it's just going to play in the background. So it was the Victorian age that Western explorers found what eluded so many. These 19th century explorers who helped solve the mystery of the Nile's source were the best of the best in the Victorian age, doing the work of Britain's Royal Ge Geographic Society. They had private sponsors, there were sultans, Egyptians, and there was a queen bent on exploring her empire. What queen was this? Queen Victoria of the Victorian age, exactly. So though today there is a debate over whose river it is, no one disputes the great strength and efforts, extremely difficult and enormous strength required of both men and women who solve this puzzle. So we have the likes of, David, of Dr. David Livingstone, who was a missionary, Sir Richard Burton, uh, John Hanning Speak, Samuel and Florence Baker, and Henry Morton Stanley, who carried enormous weight among explorers, historians, and adventurers. So if you love history, this is a story worth digging into. But as often the case in stories of heroism, there's also pranks, carefree antics, and there's some craziness. I mean, you gotta be a little crazy <laughs> to do some of these things. So many of these people did great things, but not all of them were great people. So there are crazy stories of bribery and cajole from unlikely and dangerous sources. And many Africans died trying to support the efforts of these explorers. The work of the explorers was grueling and scary. And in the mid 19th century, the Nile Basin, Basin was an unknown thicket to Westerners. So just use your imagination a little bit with maybe some of the images. Nearly every rocky, soggy, itchy step was hostile ground. Creepy, crawly insects, tsetse flies, bed bugs, mosquitoes, and black ants the size of chicklets were just as awful as the crocodiles along the shore and the pythons hanging from the trees. <laughs> and so the terrain was a little dangerous. But archaeologist Matthew Davies of the British Institute of East Africa says that the explorers, they just had to keep going. Like, no matter the dangers, they just had this drive. Now, particularly in the Victorian period, it was seen that much of the basis of European civilization came from Egypt and had some sort of influence from Egypt. So they knew that that's where their ancestors were from. And he says... I think it was so bizarre to people in the Victorian period that their whole ancestry was based upon the Nile, yet the source was unknown. And they just had to know what is the source of this river. So a teacher from a high school in Kampala, her name is Edith Megtega, shares that near the headwaters um, of, the, of the White Nile, which is considered the Victoria Lake area, she says the Victorians were looking for something that wasn't lost. I mean, 
The source was always there, but no one had seen it. So Speak was the first white man to see Lake Victoria, a major source of the river. But Magtiga says he wasn't the first person to see the lake. So we don't say discovered, she says, because we know the Africans had already seen it before him. Now it was named Lake Victoria. Who was it named after? Queen Victoria. <laughs> it's very interesting. So um, before the 19th century, Davy says the job of following the Nile from beginning to end was too difficult for anyone, European or African. So the great missionary explorer, uh, Dr. David Livingstone, died on his knees praying to understand the Nile's flow. Like, this was a big deal. But Samuel and Florence Baker found a major source of the puzzle. They approached from Sudan, walking where they couldn't sail, sailing where they couldn't walk, and moving forward where there was no going back. Crazy. Craziness. Um, and so that was just Merchants and Falls that you saw there. So we're going to bring the map, the map back up. So in 1864, they found not only where the Nile exits its major source at Lake Victoria, but how it courses later through Lake Albert before heading north to Sudan, onto Egypt, and into the Mediterranean Sea. And so that is a very brief summary of the discovery of the source of the Nile, um, even though there's really three sources. So, at all great mysteries, as I shared at the beginning, all great mysteries begin at the end and end at the beginning. And when I read that, I was like, that sounds familiar. So what, did, what does it say in, in Revelation 22, 13? I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. It's like, huh, there's a connection there. And what about the recent Ash Wednesday that we have, have we've, we've passed, where we're reminded that we come from the dust, we return to the dust, yet we have this life source in us, the Holy Spirit who breathes life into us and is with us as we breathe our last on this earth and go into our next. God is both at the beginning and the end of this life. And like a river, he's the source of all life. So water is often used as a symbol of the Holy Spirit, of new life and abundant life. And God's movements are like that of the mighty river. So waters and rivers are very important in scripture. We see them a lot. So some of the biggest examples are Israelites, the Israelites, God's people, God's chosen people, cross through a river to leave Egypt, right? They cross through the Jordan to leave Egypt. So they cross on, on dry ground. They, um, they cross, they leave bondage behind. And they cross through a river to enter the promised land. And then water shows a leaving of the old and a stepping into the new. We also have the Israelites in the desert and God brought stone out from, God brought water out from a stone Reminding the Israelites, again, that he is their source. And then on the cross, Jesus' side was pierced and water came out mixed with blood, showing us his life pouring out for us, mixed with blood, symbolizing a cleansing from our sins. And then we are baptized. We are baptized in water to symbolize a washing away of the old and then entering into the new life, new birth into the life of the spirit. So water plays a significant part. And so in a couple of scripture verses, um, I just want to share with you that reflects how nature reflects our creator. Like David, the psalmist, often, like he spent, he loved being out in nature. He was a shepherd, right? He loved to be out in nature. And so often his psalms reflect 
the imagery of God's creation and how it speaks to who God is. And so Psalm 36, five, and nine, 5 to 9, if you have your Bibles, you can turn there, Psalm 36. It says, Your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens and your faithfulness to the skies. Your righteousness is like the highest mountains. Your justice like the great deep. You, Lord, preserve both people and animals. Hmm, like a river. <laughs> how priceless is your unfailing love, O Lord. People take refuge in the shadow of your wings. They feast on the abundance of your house. You give them drink from your river of delights. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. And then Joel, the prophet Joel, says in Joel 3, verse 18, if, again, if you want to turn there in your Bibles, um, and Joel is speaking here. He says, It will come to pass in that day that the mountains shall drip with new wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the brooks of Judah shall be flooded with water. A fountain shall flow from the house of the Lord and water the valley of the Achaia. Ac I'm going to say this word wrong. It's trees. The Acacia trees, the, the valley of Acacias. In some translations, it says the Shittim, the Shittim Valley. And it's interesting here, I was digging in a little bit deeper. I'm like, what is the Valley of Acacias? And Joel was figuratively announcing that the water of life, the gospel of grace, would bring newness of life to a desolate and dying world. In this messianic picture, Christ himself is the foundation who shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the Valley of Shittim. The, following, the flowing streams of living water will reach far and wide flowing to the Gentiles and to the most remote regions of the world. God's grace is an overflowing fountain that will never run dry. It just goes out. And so there's no other source of life. And we've talked about that this morning already. There's no other source of life. He is the only source of life. Sandra, you were speaking this out Jesus took on humanity to show us the way to God, who is our source. There's no other way. And we all heard Jesus say in scripture to his disciples, he says, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to me except, no one comes to the Father except through me. So let's look at the river a little more closely to see what it's showing us. So I want to dig in a little bit deeper. So remember the Victorians, they couldn't not go on this expedition expedition they couldn't not they had to pursue it no matter how dangerous or perilous it was they understood that their ancestry came from egypt which was so dependent on the nile as a source of life so they needed to understand this because it connected to their identity their identity rested on knowing the source of that life source interesting on our humanity, looking for our identity. We all are on that journey, looking for our identity. So that longing goes even deeper in us. Knowing our actual life source gives us our sense of identity, our sense of belonging. So when we choose to follow Jesus, we've ad we are adopted into the family of God. We are sons and we're daughters. The source of our life gives us true understanding of who we are. But there is this deep longing. Isn't that interesting that the explorers had this longing physically, but we have this longing spiritually. Who created us? Who is our source? Now, there are things, there are going to be things that make this really hard to accept. Things that work against us discovering and believing this, just like those explorers. And it's interesting, it's interesting that today, the source of the Nile is now considered an open question to modern experts. Questions are being asked, are there other, other sources? Are they really correct in what they discovered? Does that sound familiar? <laughs> Back in the Garden of Eden, and even to this day, the questions come to our mind. Did God really say that? So these are things that we've talked about. The sin nature that focuses on self brings pain to us and others that separates us from God. The principalities and powers of this world 
that are out to deceive, divide, and dehumanize, seek to destroy us and our connection. The traumas we experience where our bodies hang on to things that keep us stuck in pain, these make life and the choice to follow God challenging. But the longing to know your identity, the longing to know whose you are, the longing to know who you belong to and where you've come from, that doesn't go away. And God, through Jesus, came to meet us. And so he made a way. So like a river, this longing inside of us wells up and we long to know its source. We actually long to connect to the source of our identity. There is a deep longing in us. Um, and for those on the journey that haven't met Jesus yet, they have that longing too, and they are looking for this truth, looking for this refreshing life source. So we all know that a river is a source of life. We've talked about it. It's necessary for life. So because it's a source of life, it draws everything to itself, right? People and animals of every kind, dangerous, benign, and friendly, are all drawn to a life source. And those um, who pursued this mission, the explorers, many of these people I had read did great things, but not all of them were great people. So discovering the source of life, discovering Jesus, doesn't mean that we're not going to have challenges and difficulties or be without danger or those who will hurt us. Discovering this source does not mean that we've arrived at some perfect utopia. Jesus reminds us, I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Amen. So it's through Jesus that we discover the very source of our life. The author and finisher of our faith, he will complete what he started in him and with him. We have nothing to fear for he makes a way through. So in the middle of this challenging terrain, he offers his peace. So there will be troubles, there'll be hardships, there'll be suffering. It's still a pilgrimage. It's still an adventure. And it's definitely not boring. Would you agree? It's not boring. <laughs> um, consider Jesus' invitation to his disciples. What, what, is, what does he say? He says, come follow. Come follow me. Come follow me. So there is no great exposition to embark on to make this discovery. Jesus says, I am your guide, the only guide. I will be your teacher and I will show you the way. There is no other way to get through this life. There's no other way. And so when I describe some of the things that the explorers of the Nile faced, you guys had some interesting responses. So I had said that nearly every rocky, soggy, itchy step was on hostile ground. Creepy, crawly insects, titsy flies, bed bugs, mosquitoes, and black ants the size of chiclets. <laughs> Just awful. Um, and crocodiles along the shore. I've got a picture of a crocodile that we saw. Crocodiles along the shore and pythons hanging in the trees. It doesn't sound like, you know, an example of a good time. <laughs> and so, but there is hostile ground in the spiritual realm as well. There is hostile ground. Um, and just because you can't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It was really interesting in Africa. Um, I mean, we had come across a church there and they were practicing, the kids were practicing for Sunday morning. They were practicing a play and in it, they had a witch doctor and they were trying to express to the people that it's not good to go to a witch doctor and why. And so in Uganda, you can see the evil a lot more easily than we see it in North America. 
I've heard it said in North America, it hides behind suits. Um, it hides in towers. And so it is there. It exists. But we do not have to be afraid. Um, and so I'll talk about that. But just scripture tells us that we have an enemy, right? We have an enemy. And his nature is to steal and to kill and destroy. And he's just as real as the pythons and the alligators. But we don't need to be afraid. We need to live in reality. Jesus has overcome. We need to follow the one who knows the way and submit to his plan and his purposes and his path. And we talked about that already this morning in worship, is submission to him. So remember the psalmist uh, I read from Psalm 36. He said, in, in your light, God, in your light, we see light. So we cannot save ourselves or make our way through lands we know nothing about. And I'm talking about spiritual and inner terrain. He knows the way through places that we don't. You know, it was interesting at the end of our time in Uganda, Colby and myself and Andrew and Shirley, we got to go on a safari. We went on a safari and we went with a trained ranger who traveled with a weapon. <laughs> so we didn't just go on the lands and the wilds of Africa without being with a guide and being with someone who knew what they were doing. The same in our spiritual life. We don't go this journey alone. That's why I thought it was so powerful this morning when we stood in worship with our hands connected because we go with him as our guide and we go together connected as fellow travelers so that we can encourage one another along the way. These are important things for our mind to take in and into our hearts to take in. So every day we wake up and we have the opportunity to ask, what are the steps today, Jesus? What are the steps today? So let's zoom out for a moment. So what is the mission we have as sons and daughters of the Most High God? What is the mission we have? The mission is that we would share this love that we've experienced from the Father with those around us, that we would share his love, that we would help others come to know the God, the God that we know as a loving father and as a source of life. And so as we've come to know him, we want to pour that out so others will come to know who he is and that they would live their lives for him and in him and to him. And we're all called to go out and share this excitement and share this good news. We have found the source of life. Just like the explorers found the source of the Nile and they wanted to tell everybody, we have found a source of life and we want to share this with those who are around us. This is life, life with peace and love, life that is good. And he said, we're called to go and do this. And then he says to baptize those who believe in water. <laughs> so baptism in water um, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Because what is going to happen at the end of time? And we read this in scripture, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That is where we're going. That is where we're headed. And so we have this beautiful opportunity to share the beauty and the love and the life source of our God. And it's simple, but we're really good at complicating it. So we have a clear mission it's not without its challenges and danger. And unlike the explorers of the Nile, we have someone who has done it before us and that leads the way. He is going to get us where, we were go where we're going. He will finish what he started. He has said, this is where we're going. He has said, come follow me. He has said, I will make a way where there seems to be no way. He has said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So he has faced everything, every single thing that you face, he has faced. Every temptation. And we know from Hebrews 4.15 that he didn't sin. He didn't fall. So where man could not go because of sin, Jesus has gone and he's made a way for us to go. And in Luke, he reminds us what is impossible with man, what man cannot do, is possible with God. God will do. 
And that just wells up excitement in me. It's like, you have said it, God. You have said it, and you are faithful to your word. And because of that, we know that's where we're going. So which leads me to point to the, my last point about rivers. Another thing about rivers is that they always find a way through what could be barriers. They always find a way through. And you'll, if you think back to the map, the Nile went like all over. It didn't go straight. They don't go straight. Rivers will always find a way around, under, or over. And it seems nothing can block their movement, even though it might appear blocked. So I actually Googled it. <laughs> and Google says, rivers carry a lot of water and simply and cannot simply be stopped. Even the largest reservoirs have significant outflows. So it's interesting, I'm thinking of like, even if it's dammed, what happens? <sighs> the water spreads. It always moves, it's always going. And so rivers are a powerful force. The water brings life, the water can also destroy. We've seen that in, in floods and storms. God is a powerful force, just like the rivers of water. And as followers of Jesus who have turned to Jesus and said, I want you to take control of my life. I want you to be at the center of my life. We have that life force in us through the Holy Spirit. He is always with us and his power resides in us to help us. And he will show us how to navigate the difficult terrain because he is the source of all life. So putting ourselves in him and then jumping into the river, <laughs> getting wet, splashing ourselves, splashing those around us. We want to jump into what he's doing and put our focus on him first. And then remember, like we did today, that we need people around us to help us navigate this life and to practice, to make mistakes with, to receive grace from, to be encouraged by. So just in summary, like the river, God is the source of our life flow. He is the beginning and he is the end. He is the way. He is the truth and he is the life. That has been a verse that's been on my, head, my mind for quite some time. <laughs> He's all of those things, and he shows us the way to the Father. And so there's this encouragement to get in the river and flow with him. Secondly, everything is drawn to that source of life. So the terrain in and around it can be treacherous at times. Despite this, we long to connect with it, and he longs to connect with us. Um, so because it's our source, Jesus has overcome the difficulties of this world he gives us peace and he leads us through. He has promised his presence with us as we navigate this difficult terrain. That's his promise to us. I will be present with you. And we have fellow travelers who can help us. It's part of how we're strengthened. And thirdly, the mighty river, like God's plans, cannot be stopped. Though at times it can look that way and we might question but he's making a way where there appears to be no way. And you can hang on to that one. <laughs> and when we choose to follow Jesus' way, he gives us his Holy Spirit. So that mighty power lives in us. And we can navigate this crazy world with his strength. And yes, sometimes we can feel crazy too. <laughs> it's a crazy world. But he has promised his presence with us. So my call to us today, and this is including myself, in sharing this with you is to encourage all of you to live life with your eyes wide open. Both your physical eyes, see God at work in the world around you through nature and through, peop and through people, but also that the eyes of your interior world, some may say the eyes of your heart, some may say the eyes of your soul, that's in reference to your interior world. It's your mind, it's your will, it's your emotions. Turn your interior eyes to him. Don't curve inward, upward. And so allow him to be the center of your thoughts, your will, and your emotions. Because he is in you and he's around you all the time. So now what? Now what? 
The Father's heartbeat for his children and for his church is that you would really and truly know your source of life and strength and that you would go to it every day. Every day. And again, it's so interesting that worship, we also talked about this. We need it every day. Colby went through all the days of the week. <laughs> That you turn your heart to him every day, get water every day. I watch the Ugandans go and get water every day. There's a few pictures here. We need to go and we need to get water every day. And I know it's not easy to go and get water every day. And there are three things that the Lord has been speaking to me very clearly for more than a year. And he uses all kinds of people nature and things to remind me. These three things are slow down, be quiet, simplify your life. And I also believe that he's speaking these things to many of you. Slow down, be quiet, simplify your life. It's a reminder that drinking daily from our life source in Jesus is not a nice to do. It's critical. It's necessary. We need his life source. We need that connection every day. So today, what is one way you can start to disarm or loosen the hold of the culture on your life? The culture keeps us busy, keeps us distracted, and keeps us consumed by stuff. And I want to encourage you just to pick one thing. And maybe you've already done that because we've headed into Lent. Maybe you've already gone that route. And if you have, awesome. Keep walking forward. Be encouraged. But if you haven't yet taken a moment to stop and say, whew, do I have that rhythm in my life? It could be something that is creating a sense of internal dissatisfaction in your life. And I just want to share a quick story with you. For example, how, how are you feeling after watching television? How are you feeling after scrolling through social media? Or how are you feeling after a really busy week? Pay attention to those feelings. Or, this, or restlessness. It could be a restlessness inside of you. Years ago, I started noticing how much of my life was spent watching TV. Um, there were shows I really liked. But I also felt this tension inside of me of wanting, I wanted to do more reading and I desire to have more time to dig into scripture and prayer. So, but I like these TV shows, but I wanted to do these other things and read and, and spend more time with God. So there is this tension. And so a day was so quickly finished, right? You, you go to work for eight or, nine, eight or nine hours, you prepare the meal, you eat, you watch TV, and you go to bed. That can feel like a cycle in our lives. And I started to feel really dissatisfied with my routine. So what could I change? Well, I needed to work. I needed to eat. But I didn't need to watch TV for two to three hours in the evening. So I thought, OK, um, I can stop watching you know, right until bedtime and give myself an hour. And I can read, and I can journal and pray. So I started to do that. And I chose to face my reality. And I allowed myself to be present to what was really happening inside of me. TV in itself is not bad. The time I was giving it, it wasn't helpful, and it wasn't, it wasn't really what I wanted. And it didn't meet the longing I was feeling inside. And I have a choice. I can make changes. I have a choice. You have a choice. We can make changes. So internal dissatisfaction is an opportunity to pay attention to deeper desires and longings inside of you that can give you space to be more present to Jesus. Now, now years later, I watch very little TV because there's other things that I actually desire more. And so I've just let that go and do the things that I actually desire more. So we have a deep longing and desire to know God, to know our source of life, to know the one to whom we belong and our identity in him. And so I encourage you to pay attention. Pay attention to what is happening in you and what is one thing you could do differently this week 
or maybe until Easter or in Lent, what is one thing you can do differently? And let the source of life, your Father God, do a greater work in you that will go beyond you and have a bigger impact than you will ever have on your own. He is saying, come, come, come and follow me, really follow me. Put away your distractions, slow down, be quiet, and simplify. Drop those weights he never asked you to carry. Drop those weights he never asked you to carry. He is saying, I'll help you. I have so much to offer you. And when I was, when I was going through the story on the Nile, I was reminded in the spiritual life too, there is no fast track. There is no substitutions. There is no way around. There are no bribes you can pay. Following his way, stepping into that river is the real deal. Now, some of you might say, well, Tracy, you're preaching to the choir. We're in church. Of course we get this. I'm going to say that most of us don't fully get this. And if I'm still learning this, I know you are as well. We've had glimpses, but we're still hanging on to backpacks of stuff. And a lot of our heart is behind closed doors. Because the terrain at times is tough. And so sometimes we close the door. So his invitation this morning is to come out from behind the closed doors. To drop the backpack. His ways are more impressive than any of us will ever, ever be or ever experience. And our fullness of life comes as we allow him to be all that he is in us and through us. So the big ask is, who wants to go on a God adventure? <laughs> who wants to go on a God adventure? Adventure awaits. This is a picture that Rick Berry painted that he shared with us this past fall at the arts conference we did. Now, I'm not asking you to go to Africa, okay? I'm not asking you to sail the Nile. I'm just asking you to take one step forward, to open a door in your heart that has been closed because life got difficult or because the terrain around you has not been easy. Life got hard, so you close some doors. And will you let him take you one step further? Maybe just open the door a little bit. Let some light in to those places in your heart. And you might find yourself saying, God, I need you to show up because I don't know how to do this life in this moment. I thought I did, but there's this thing overwhelming me, but I'm angry, but I'm sick, but I'm grieving right now, but I'm struggling in addiction, but I've got pain, mental, emotional, physical but I'm struggling with anxiety, but I'm depressed. My job or maybe my ministry isn't going the way I thought it should go. My kids are driving me crazy or they're breaking my heart. I'm losing sleep over a broken relationship. I'm struggling to forgive. God, I need you to show up. I need your help. The train of this life is hard. It really is. I'm going to ask our worship team to come on back. The train is difficult. And surrender to the very source of our life, Jesus, is what helps us navigate this train. And he's going to show you what you need. So I want to encourage you this morning, how do you let him take the lead? Stop trying to do it for him or trying to do it on your own. Adventure awaits. What is that next step this morning? And so I want to ask our worship team to lead us in a song. And I just, I first want to encourage us, just take a few minutes with the Father and let him speak to you. 
But I also just this morning sense that if there's anyone here this morning that hasn't taken the opportunity to turn their hearts towards Jesus and say, Jesus, I don't want to live for myself anymore. I want to live for you. I just want to encourage you this morning to, to do that. To say, Jesus, I don't want to live for myself. I want to live for you. I want to walk the way and on the path that I have for you. Because he's asking this morning. He's knocking at our heart's doors and he's saying, follow me. Will you follow me? I can give you something that is so much more than you can ever ask or imagine. I will give you life and life to the full. And I will promise you my presence with you in the middle of the hard things in life. And my presence will be enough to sustain you and help you walk through. And so the team is just going to lead us in a, in a bit of worship. I'm going to come back. Um, and I'm just going to ask our prayer teams to prepare themselves as well. I'd like to have time, a time for people to come for prayer. And so we're just going to spend a few moments in worship. And then I will come back. So let the Father just lead you and speak to you. <laughs>